let's go to, to page four. And we're also on page four if you're in the book. And these next three pages are going to discuss some of the fundamental conventions, concepts, and controls used throughout Photoshop. And these are critical habits to get into. And like I said, you're going to refer back to these notes. So if you don't get all this the first time, don't worry about it. Just keep in mind that these fundamentals are discussed throughout this and future seminars. So don't get hung up on the details at this point. If something doesn't make sense right now, just move on. So the first bullet point on page four heed the advice of the old adage guy go garbage in garbage out and it's corollary good in and good out so you need to start with good dig uh, digitized images that are well exposed and composed otherwise and although photoshop is a very powerful program it is not a miracle program able to turn trash into diamonds remember the old csi show and you know they would take a screen grab of somebody 400 feet away from a tiny little itty bitty camera and they'll enlarge it and they can read the guy's social security number on his badge or whatever you know uh, it's that's ridiculous uh so that's why i just wanted to say that no garbage in garbage out good in good out uh, let's see on the next uh, bullet point on the page here photoshop is just a tool a very powerful tool but a tool nonetheless and as i mentioned previously i think it was my digital enlarger remember i showed you that picture the enlarger earlier I think that makes sense. What I want you to do in a dark room and larger in the analog world, I can now do in Photoshop with lots more control and options. Uh, the next uh, bullet point is to keep it super simple. Start with the basics of Photoshop and grow into other functions as you need them. And as I mentioned earlier, most of the time, you're only going to need about 10 to 15% of Photoshop's functionality to achieve the results that you want. And you can pretty much ignore the rest. Sometimes less is more, or as one of my clients recently put it, simplify and demystify. And I've applied that one to my life too, simplify and demystify. Next bullet point down, uh, when it comes to working with Photoshop, there are a zillion ways to get the job done. I could show you 20 ways to adjust your contrast. That being said, I found that the methods that I'm gonna show you over the next five classes are the simplest, most effective, and least destructive to your file to achieve the desired results. And they are also time-tested in a commercial and artistic environment, working environment. I mean, I've been doing this professionally since the, the 80s, and I've learned a few things along the way. <laughs> now, that being said, I'm, I am open to new suggestions and, and new what have you, but a lot of times there's a re I probably already have tried to do what you're trying to do and found that there's a reason I don't. So if you got a question about that, let me know. And in fact, that goes to the next bullet point. I've also found that the generic tools such as brightness, contrast, or color balance controls are too global, simplistic, or destructive to the image to be of any major use. Remember, think the manual transmission versus the automatic transmission that I showed you earlier. And oh, by the way, I define destructive. Uh, as causing pixelization and posterization to your digital image resulting in bad prints, which is the bottom line. We want the best prints we can get. So would we go to class two in two weeks, we'll talk a lot about using levels and use saturation instead of the brightness and uh, brightness, contrast, and color balance tool. I've already mentioned this, practice, 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 homework, just like any other activity worth pursuing, you're gonna get more proficient and faster at Photoshop the more you practice. Uh, and it, it, again, that 2080 rule that we talked about earlier, the 80% that Priscilla described it so well when she said that that's the homework. So you'll remember 20% and the other 80% may be buried in here, but you're going to have to go and watch some videos, open uh, Photoshop and look at all these things that I'm showing you. Last bullet point on page four. There are two excellent sources of information often overlooked. The help section include with Photoshop, which is really good if you want to know how something is done, not necessarily why. Like if I ever wanted to know how to use the magnetic lasso tool, which I've literally never used, but for some reason I decide I need to, I can find out how by you looking in the help section in Photoshop. And another overlooked resource is the internet, of course. Um, I've just dedicated a page to all of the videos that I've recorded this summer. On the links page at the front of the notes, at the very bottom, free Photoshop 101 videos. We're now getting into the second round of these. Let's go to page five and we'll talk about some concepts. Be safe with your original image files and duplicate your original. In case of major mistakes, file corruption, loss of data, and so on, it's important to make sure that your original file is safe. Now, those of you who own a Windows machine, I know you've never had the blue screen of death. Try having the blue screen of death 
or any other kind of interruption like that or file corruption after you've worked on your original file and you're screwed. So you always want to make a, a duplicate of your original and keep your original around for safekeeping in case you do have problems later on. By the way, in the useful downloads page, there is near the bottom, you can download a workflow chart, which is a linear representation of a proper workflow in Photoshop. We'll be using that a lot in class four, the master file creation and workflow. If you have my book, that linear flow chart is already in the front of the book and it's called workflow chart. I know, catchy, huh? Okay, we're gonna also create a master file and the goal is to create a multi-purpose unflattened master file for each image that you wish to enhance. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail on master files, so let's come back to that. Uh, one of the things that you can do with Photoshop is you can work globally as well as locally, and it gives you the ability to make corrections and adjustments locally, affects, which affects only a portion of your image by making selections covered in another workshop. In the old analog world, corrections are almost always global, uh, particularly when it came to color corrections, or you got into a lot of very fancy dodging and burning, uh, and you can get very creative with that, where you stick your hands or pieces of cardboard or coins welded on a piece of wire to hold back or lighten and darken certain areas of your image. You also want to work in adjustment layers, and you'll look if you'll look on the PowerPoint slide in front, you'll see a visual representation of what adjustment layers are. What layers are actually now just these just happen to be adjustment layers I'm showing you. There's all sorts of different kinds of layers. But think of layers as transparent overlays, if you will, over your image, each layer doing something a little bit different. When you see the layers panel, think of it as a two-dimensional side view of your image. Here's your original capture down here, and here it is in this three-dimensional look. And then on this one here, we use the layer mask. Uh, and an adjustment layer to work on only a portion of the image. We adjusted contrast on that one. Then we worked on our color on this one, so on and so forth. And I hope that makes a little more sense. We'll talk about this a lot more in f future classes, but when you see a black and white mask in your adjustment layer, that's exactly what it is. It is a layer mask where white reveals the effects of your adjustment layer and black hides. So for instance, on this layer right here where you see white, and you see it's, it's a sky is what it is, that's a palm tree. That sky is the only thing being adjusted and it's not adjusting anything below. So that's one of the local corrections I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, I think it's easier to conceptualize adjustment layers when you see this picture here. We're still on the same page, page five, page five in the book also, if you have the book. Here's some more concepts. You should standardize your workflow. It's important that you work in the various steps of your image in the order shown in the workflow chart at the beginning of the book, or well, or that you can download. Uh, for instance, you always adjust your contrast before your color, because if you adjust your color and then adjust your contrast, you're probably gonna throw your color out. So that's why you want to standardize your workflow, and the best way to do that is to use the linear workflow chart that we will be working on in class four and that you can also download from the useful downloads page and yes anything on the useful downloads page is free tonal compression well tonal compression is the inevitable reduction degradation of the original scene from your eyes to the print and it's pure physics there's not a darn thing you can do about it all you can do is minimize it so i've made a little chart here to give you an idea and this will also show you why you should be shooting for raw in your important images this right here this hundred this is what your eye sees. And let's just say it's 100 uh, uh, shades of color. If you shoot with your camera in RAW, you, the tonal compression will automatically bring it down to 70 shades. And if you're shooting JPEG, you're down to 40. Now you see why you don't want to shoot your important stuff in JPEG. Then when you bring it into Photoshop, that 100 shades of color is now 30 shades. And in RAW, it's, it's 60 shades. And when you print it out, 45 shades and 15 shades for uh, for JPEG. So you can see there's actually triple the amount of information available from a raw file for your final print as far as tonal compression. So you'll see on page five, how can you minimize some of the effects of tonal compression? And that's all you can do. You can't eliminate it. Shoot in raw. We just shown on, on here why you should be shooting in raw. Use a proper color working space in Photoshop. We'll talk about that in class three and have your color management house in order. And we'll talk about color management in, actually talk about color working space and color management in class five.
It's called Color Management 101. So I would encourage you to sign up for that also. There is a, uh, a post called The Philosophy of Raw. You can find a link to that in the notes, I believe. And that will explain some of the things about RAW that are really, really important. Next concept, if you start with a 16-bit file, then work in 16-bit as long as possible. If your original image is in 16-bit, which is such as a RAW file, keep working in 16-bit as long as you can in Photoshop, at least through the creation of your master file. So you got gobs and oodles more information in 16-bit than you do in 8-bit. It's not just a doubling of the amount of information, it's hundreds of times more information because it's a logarithmic function. In the same way a Richter scale is, if you will, for an earthquake, where a 6.0 earthquake is twice as powerful as a 5.0 earthquake. Let's go to the next page, page six. First thing is I would suggest that you work in Adobe RGB as your working color space or Profoto RGB, either one works. There is a blog, well, you'll have to go to the blog and search for it, but it's called Soft Proofing Plus RGB Color Spaces, and it will explain to you why I prefer Adobe RGB and other things that I think you'll find very, very useful. We're going to talk about setting up your color settings in, in a minute here, uh, and I'll show you physically in Photoshop how to do that so that your working space does become Adobe RGB. There is no color space in RAW. RAW is just literally a bucket of gobs and oodles of information. So if you, somebody says, well, I have Pro Photo in my RAW file. No, you don't. Okay. It's, there is no color space in RAW. You'll add a color space when you bring it through Adobe Camera Raw or Develop Module and then bring it into Photoshop. Save your file frequently as you're working. Uh, I, I like to save every time I add a new layer. That way I don't forget. And those that know me, well, in fact, you'll find a, I told you you guys had homework in the, in the blog, there's a post called, not a fan of Photoshop speed keys, here are the 10 essential ones. And here's one right here, the fourth bullet point down on page six, which is what we're on now, which is Command S, which is for save in a Mac, and Windows is Control S. Save it frequently. There's nothing worse than getting, 45 minutes through an image like we talked about earlier and realize oh, you made a boo-boo and you just wasted 45 minutes. You know, save as you go along and that way if you do have a boo-boo, you can go back to the one point where you've always saved. Save your important images and your master files as a PSD or TIFF file, not JPEG. And there's three reasons which are listed on page six. Every time that you open, work on and save a JPEG, there is degradation because a JPEG compression scheme is not what's called lossless. It's a very lossy compression scheme. A TIFF or a PSD though, just so you know, is lossless when you save it. You're not gonna throw any information out. You cannot save a JPEG in 16-bit, which takes away a lot of all the advantages of all that information, and you cannot save a JPEG with layers, which again, will negate the effects of a master file, which again, we're gonna talk about in just a second. Next bullet point, save your master files at 300 pixels per inch. This is the optimum pixels per inch setting for viewing, prepping, and printing your image. Anything more than 300 pixels per inch is a waste because your eye cannot resolve it. Uh, anything less and you're not able to take advantage of your printer. And as an aside here, a little known fact, all printers out there are 300 pixels per inch digitally, 300 pixels per inch, not uh, dots per inch. There, are, Yes, there are inkjet printers out there that have 1,440 by 1,440 dots per inch of ink laid down. I know because I've counted them. Ha ha. Just kidding. So when you're saving your master file, it's no use. Or it's just a waste of, of space to save it at, at any more than 300 pixels per inch. And all printers, all means all, and that's all, all means all printers print at 300 pixels per inch from your file. Turn on the Photoshop's ruler for, uh, I'm on third bullet point from the bottom, page six. Turn on the Photoshop's ruler for easier viewing of your image. Uh, I like to have it turned on in the document window as it seems to give the image a sense of perspective. It talks about how to do that there uh, and to see what your image will look like. Next bullet point down, uh, what your image will look like size-wise in the real world on your monitor. There's a procedure there that you can go through at your, at your leisure where you're going to enlarge and reduce the size of your image 
If you take a physical ruler and hold it up against your screen and then have your image up with the ruler viewing in your document window, you just basically get as close to one to one and that is what your one to one value is. Why is that helpful? Because if you need to know your sharpening, you need to know what it actually what your actual size is. So I hope that kind of makes sense. I kind of stumbled through that, but I think if you go back and read what I wrote here under this uh, this bullet point on page six, second from the bottom will make more, more sense. Flattened versus unflattened file. A flattened file has all the layers collapsed in the image as seen in the layers panel or reduce the file size. A flattened file is best for printing. And an unflattened file has all the, lower, the layers ex, uh, expanded in the layers panel. A master or archive file, which we're going to talk about next, should be unflattened so that you can easily make corrections later non-destructively, meaning low loss of data or pixels. If you recall, when we looked at, yeah, here's an image that's unflattened, if you will. And what we would do, and it would also reflect in the layers panel, when we flatten that image and it talks about how to do that on page six, then you won't have all these various layers. They'll be down in one. And there's a reason for that, multiple reasons. Uh, uh, one is to reduce the file size before printing. You never want to flatten your master file, ever, ever, ever.